Um, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and welcome to uh, Mobile World Congress. And welcome to the Connected Women Update. Um, it's great to see so many people up here. Apologies for the standing room only in some cases, but it's great to see um, you're all so interested in this. And also, um, I'm really pleased to see a lot of familiar faces from our previous events, um, from New York, from Barcelona before, and also from Brussels, um, and also some new faces. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, so what I'm here to do, um, I'm going to introduce our speakers shortly. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to um, talk you through the future plans and the updates um, for Connected Women um, on what we're planning on doing. So we've already in the previous events been talking um, about the, the digital skills gap. Um, and the question is, um, how are we going to accelerate the power of the female mobile economy? And we'll hear more about the female mobile economy um, from Maria Molina from AT Kearney um, as they just released um, a report in the UK. Um, so I won't, I won't steal any of Maria's thunder. So we want to stimulate real industry change and we have four big goals um, that we are looking at which looks at accelerating the growth of the female economy we want to lead on the digital global agenda, improve the industry reputation, and close the connectivity gap. So one of the things that we are doing as well is um, we are going to be working a lot more closely um, with our M Women team. And I know um, most of you um, already know about the great work um, that they've been doing. Um, and indeed, they had um, their event yesterday. And I know that a lot of you um, were there also as well yesterday. So we have some global conferences um, that I just want to highlight and point out to you. Um, and we also have um, some update meetings as well. But within those big goals that we just talked about, one of the big pieces of work that we want to do is state of the industry research. So as we know, there's a lot of research out there. Um, but we need to get the lie of the land in terms of where this industry is. And then um, we, can, we can monitor it and track it as we move forward. We're also going to need some help for that, um, but that's kind of that's that's where we're going to start. Um, we're also looking at um, closing the connectivity gap, as I mentioned earlier, and removing those barriers to connectivity because we have to do that for connected women to be connected. They have to be connected in the first instance. So we've, as we've said here, we've done the, we're going to do the research program. We're going to do the practical workshops. Um, we started doing those already at our previous global events. And I'm very pleased to say that we have some great case studies from that. Um, and you'll be hearing um, on one of those later in, in the speeches. We're looking at greater stakeholder engagement. Um, we're already um, very heavily supported by a number of groups. Um, and a big thank you um, to GTWN um, and a lot of their uh, board members are here today as well, which is great to see. Thank you for coming. Um, and we're also, um, we're working very closely with our public policy team as well, um, as we want to work a lot closer with countries and, and government in terms of creating the awareness that's needed around the digital skills gap. Um, we need greater media engagement. And we're also looking at creating a framework for mentoring. So we're not going to run a mentor mentoree program, but we're going to create the framework um, that the industry can take to make, start making those changes and create those case studies um, that we need. So where are we going to do this? We're going to continue convening because as you can see, we need to continue doing this. Um, and we're going to do that in a number of ways <coughs> um, because we need to keep this networking going as well. And we're also going to do that eventually through, um, through our website. So we're at the update meeting now. We're going to be working with the ITU on Girls in Tech. Um, and they've also asked me to pass on a message to everybody that um, please do get your organizations involved. It happens on the, the fourth Thursday of every April. This year it's on the 24th of April. I know in some countries that's holiday, so it doesn't have to be that exact day. Um, but you can go to ICT, ICT, um, girlsinict.org for more information and there's packs on there as well as to 
what kind of activities to do, but please see me after um, around what kind of activities they are. Uh, what, what they do like to do is, is get young girls, basically it's all about encouraging young girls into this industry and getting them excited about it. So we're going to work GSMA um, in Korea with the Ministry of Science and Technology. Um, and we're going to, we're going to have, the, uh, have our day over there. We're then uh, moving to Sydney um, and also um, hopefully to Melbourne um, to do two um, other half-day events there. And there'll be more information on the website coming out about that. We're then doing, um, we have our Mobile Asia Expo in June, where we'll hopefully be launching um, our research um, report. We'll be kicking that off um, during Mobile Asia Expo. Um, so do let me know as well if you're planning on going to Shanghai, um, as it would be great to get you involved in that round table as well. The next global conference has been interesting this week. I've heard so many rumours about where the global conference is. Um, so it is looking likely it will be in the States. Um, no, it won't be New York, but um, watch this space. <laughs> I'd love it to be in Miami, yes. Um, this is very Miami. Um, yes, but we, I will announce that later, but it definitely will be in the States, and that's looking at being around October time. And then we're also um, looking at another event. Um, we'll be working with our uh, M4D mobile for development team who are having a summit in Cape Town in November. Um, so again, we'll, we will have the one brand name by then for both Connected Women and M Women. Um, and so we'll look to launch that throughout the year as well. And thank you to Shireen who sat down at the front here. For anybody that doesn't know Shireen, um, she's from that team. So we'll be doing a lot of networking, a lot of research, a lot of workshops. Um, we need your help to continue this. Um, any of the groups that you're working with, any case studies that you have, do let us have them. Um, anyway, I will uh, pass on to um, our next illustrious speaker, Vicky McLeod, who's Secretary General um, for GTWN, who's got um, a, an update on the research for us. Well, thank you very much, Vicky. It's wonderful to be back here today. And uh, as some of you that I recognize know, I've been involved with this program since Vicky started it, since its inception in Brussels. And I'm pleased to say, as always, that we women are very, very active people because those who've been involved know that in Brussels, we were enriching the mobile ecosystem. And then we moved on to uh, various meetings in New York in October where we were breaking the mold, so we got even more active. And now we're talking about accelerating the female economy. So what do I mean by the female economy and why does it matter to the mobile industry? Um, you could uh, break it up in, in a number of ways and use a number of analogies, but I've chosen to break it into four for today's purpose. And I think we, we need to think about women not just as a total group, but in a number of roles in the economy and society. Uh, for example, there's women as consumers, and I know we're going to hear later from um, an expert on that area. There's also women as social networkers, and those who work in marketing know how important social marketing is today to the business community. And so we need to think about how women are involved in the economy through social networking and how potentially we can tap into that area and influence what they're doing. There's also women as entrepreneurs and the Global Telecom Women's Network, which we have a number of our members here today, is an organization that works in this area as well. So women are increasingly becoming their own entrepreneurs, becoming their own bosses, starting businesses. And this changes their role in the economy so that they can match their working environment to their other commitments. And I think a lot of us um, can recognize that in our own lives. And then there's also a category that I call women as experts. So not necessarily women as IT experts, but in other areas. Firstly, women as consumers. I think it's important to recognize that women now drive the world economy. That's not me saying this, it's uh, the Boston Consulting Group talking about the control that women now have over the spending and um, purchasing power. 
And here they have pointed out that globally women control $20 trillion in annual consumer spending. And in the time of the report, which was approximately five years ago, they expected by now that figure to climb to $28 trillion. So that is certainly something to sit up and take notice about. Also, I think it's important factor to think that women know what women want. And I think a lot of us have had experience of having uh, goods and services supposedly designed for women, but that do not match our needs or our expectations. One is the infamous Dell Pink Laptop, and I'm sorry if there's somebody <laughs> here from Dell, but uh, that's often used as a rather cruel example of perhaps something that's designed for a female market that actually doesn't miss, uh, that misses the mark. And, but a good example is H&M, the um, clothing retailer. And here, as it says, that there's 77% of those store managers and 7 out of 11 of the board members are female. And that is um, thought to be why they are being so successful in their chosen market. There may be other reasons, but that's a good one. And as I mentioned before, social networking, I think it's very important for us to understand how women and men differ in their use of social networking. As you can see in this chart, um, there was a wide differential um, earlier on, but the gap is actually narrowing. It's now 8% gap between men and women. And I think this is one of the areas we need to understand more um, as, we, as the mobile industry moves into applications and services, especially in the retail area, um, B2B in the B2C area. So why, how do women use social networking? What expectations do they have? And if we're trying to use social marketing, how do we use that effectively? For example, um, Pinterest, uh, if we go to the next slide, we have um, <coughs> some more details from some research that has been done by the Pew Research Centre. And you'll see there that, for example, there is a, diff a substantial differential between Facebook, between men and women. Um, Pinterest is the most obvious, that is five times as many women use Pinterest as men. Um, and interestingly, more men use YouTube and Google than women at this stage. So I think, again, if you're trying to sell to women, you need to understand that it may not be the best idea to put a YouTube video out there. It may be better to um, use Pinterest or some other uh, platform to do it. And I'd also like to talk about the important field of women as entrepreneurs. We're all aware, especially with Global Board Ready Women initiatives and quotas and etc., that there is an increasing number of leaders and decision makers are women. And this is an area too we need to think about because they may have different backgrounds and interests to their male colleagues. Uh, many women who go onto boards say that that surprises them. They're serving on a board with, with men and they realize that they have a different perspective. And they may prioritize the social as well as economic impact of their decision making. Now this is obviously a terrible generalization, <laughs> um, but, but just in, in general terms, we need to think about how a perspective from, from a female may change the decision making. And women are increasingly becoming entrepreneurs, as I mentioned before. So they might combine their family and home duties with starting a business. And obviously mobile technology is a key element in that because it provides the ability to rapidly start a business and have global reach in a very small time. And also more women on boards, I think, will change the culture of business as we go forward and that be is implemented. And the final category I'd like to talk about is women as experts. Um, Vicky knows that um, I've been on about this for a while, saying, well, I've looked at um, girls in ICT and trying to get more women into the STEM subjects, science, technology, and mathematics. And we don't appear to be having as much impact there as we'd like. So I have suggested that we look more towards the areas that women are actually working in. If you look at the labor statistics, most women work in the areas that they find of social impact in health, education, in tourism and government, and often they are in client-facing roles. 
a very, only a very small number of women actually work primarily in ICT, and these figures are not actually changing very much. The mobile industry needs to move faster into the parts of the economy that where the women are represented as it evolves beyond pure technology into the application of technology into health, education, retail, etc. And I believe that the industry could benefit from courses being offered that combine female preferred subjects with ICT and also with direct recruitment from these subject matter experts. We met a number of them, didn't we, in New York, where we've got some lovely talented women coming through the health sector into the mobile industry because of that reason. And this slide just proves that point. So if you look at the top of the slide, you'll see information technology is only 3%. And as you go down, you get more into the areas where women are actually, these big blocks, where women are actually involved in education and health, so 15% government measure and hospitality. So this is female to male, if you like, in very broad terms. And that is a picture of the problem that we're facing, or the challenge that we're facing. These are US labor statistics, and the question is, is that a universal picture? Does it vary from culture to culture, from country to country, region to region? We don't know the answers to that at the moment, and it's a very interesting point. So finally, I'd just like to summarize by saying that what I think needs to happen now is we need, as Vicky suggested, more thorough research into the potential of the female economy for the mobile sector. We need to focus on the interface between mobile technology and the four categories of women as consumers, social networkers, entrepreneurs and experts. We need a global picture of the female economy, its prospects for the mobile industry and what we can learn from different countries, different regions, different cultures. And Vicky's already gone through her plans for meetings this year and I think that will start to build up this picture as we move around the world and identify if we're looking for it, identify the similarities and the differences. And all of this, of course, is aimed to formulate advice for the mobile industry on how best to capture the potential of the female economy. Thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, okay, Jordana Linfield. Um, I'm pleased to welcome um, Director of Future Communications, um, Etty Salat. Hello everybody, this is very scary. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, if I was talking to 50 men, I would be feeling more comfortable than to 50 women. So please give me a smile. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you. And this is just to show you how what we think is not true, because probably you think this is so easy for me, but actually it is not, I don't know why. Uh, but I know in about a couple of seconds I will forget it. Uh, so. Uh, uh, this Mobile World Congress uh, had a buzz uh, yesterday uh, with a speech of Facebook uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg and, uh, and actually I am meeting him after this session. Can you believe it? Yeah. I am meeting him uh, through Etisalat. I am representing Etisalat which is a huge company in Middle East and Africa and I am going to be talking business with him and I just cannot believe it because you will hear my story and uh, that changed so much once I made a decision to change. And, uh, uh, so, the, the, the CEO of the, of the Facebook, uh, Cheryl, she said that uh, if our companies uh, and uh, the countries uh, were run by women, the world had been much easier and much better world. And I really, really believe in that. And I believe that in practice and in theory, because half of my team are women. And I really, really need women in my team because of the attention to detail, because of the different approach, because of the skills uh, that they bring. And uh, if you think uh, that this is only what women believe, you will be wrong because all my colleagues uh, also believe that they need women. So it's everybody believes, so where are you? We need you. And, uh, uh, and so I want to tell you that uh, um, perhaps I feel more comfortable with men because uh, I've been working in the mobile industry for 25 years. Yes, I am this old and uh, uh, I have moved from London. Um, one year ago, I worked uh, for many years for Telefonica Digital, and uh, it was, um, let's say, for 20, well, let me just start the story. I have just met uh, in Ericsson stand uh, my colleague, uh, who uh, is from my country, I'm originally from Croatia, 
So uh, we studied together electronics and telecommunications, five years university. And it was so hard that I couldn't do it on my own, so I have found the ugliest guy in the class, I was like, you are going to teach me. And, uh, uh, and sorry, this was not the ugliest. I don't want to be like that. <laughs> but that guy, I met him today. He finished two universities, maths and electronics, in half of the time. So in two years, he was ready. And then through this, he was explaining to me and helping me. I mean, I was helping him as well, because he probably was so disorganized that uh, he would never have finished without me. And that's what he told me. So I met him today. After so many years, 20 years, and, uh, and he gave me his card, and I saw the card, and he was just a, a manager, he was like a manager there in, the, in a small country, he's still in the Belgrade, he still lives with his parents, he is a manager, and I was like, wow, you know, I am director of telecommunications of Etisalat, hello, this is amazing, hello. and uh, this all has changed only in the last four years. I, I have two babies, I call them babies, but they are four. And uh, when they were born, um, I decided to have my comeback to work, because indeed, like that guy, I spent 20 years working for O2 in, in London, um, in technical area, in the technology. Uh, I thought that was the cleverest thing I could ever do. Like, you want me to do design for this? Yeah, I do design, you know, I do the signaling bits, I do the protocol. This is so clever. But my impact was zero. I could not change a thing. I was just executing somebody else's strategy, and I wasn't even seeing the full picture. And yet, for 20 years, I thought I was the cleverest person on earth. And, uh, and then after that, uh, I saw this picture in the magazine after having uh, uh, my, my, my babies, and this was this businesswoman. She was in a red suit. She was, you know, really powerful, and she was holding two kids, uh, you know, like, uh, like uh, you know, uh, toddlers. And I was like, uh, wow, I want that, you know. I want that because, you know, suit means power, etc. It's a power dressing, but I knew what I wanted. Only, not because of that picture, but it was in my mind, and, uh, and, um, it's very emotional because it's all true. And you know what? My girls are so beautiful. And my job is better of the job of that woman in the last, you know, four years, just because I made a decision to do that. And the way how I did it uh, was that um, I didn't wait for somebody else. I didn't wait for my boss to give me a promotion because obviously he wanted me to stay in the same position because I was so good in that position and he could do nothing and have coffees. And I actually worked for him for 15 years. And everybody would tell me, why are you doing that? You know, why are you making this guy successful? And I said, oh, I don't know, you know, but I can go on a holiday whenever I want. I can work from home. And they told me, but you can do that anyway. And, uh, uh, and I was thinking about it. And then, so what I did is, uh, uh, then you think like, uh, maybe another woman can help me. Uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, but, you know, of course, that another woman can help you, uh, but it, you need more than one woman to help you. You know, you need, you need, a, you need a strategy, you need to close your eyes. Uh, and Marie Curie, who invented the radioactivity, she said uh, that uh, every woman is gifted for something. Uh, you have to know what it is, uh, and you have to make it happen. And that's what she did. I mean, she won, uh, you know, she, she invented something amazing. Uh, so each of you, you need to get out of your comfort zone, like I did, uh, and uh, try to make your dreams come true. But the things they tell you, oh, you know, you can never have a nice husband, and you can never have kids, and you can never do everything. This is not true. You can have it all. You don't have to sacrifice anything. You only need to have a dream and to start implementing in small steps. You don't have to be perfect. You have to, um, you have to be smart. And you do need to talk to your, uh, um, somebody, call it a mentor, call it a coach, doesn't really matter. But you need to have somebody to support you uh, on this journey. And do, I mean, so many changes, just to tell you, even three months, my husband will tell you that I am obsessive networker. Because during the first three months after coming from maternity leave, I had a million coffees per day. And, uh, and literally, I would be talking to everybody in my company. And uh, the first person I went to talk to was the director of marketing. 
I wasn't even afraid to talk, she was a lady, she's a lady, to talk to director to marketing because I am entitled to talk to her. So I booked a meeting and I went to see her and uh, uh, she didn't know me and I said, I'm Dragana and, uh, and she was like, why are you here? I said, um, well, we have something in common. She says, what is it? I said, you are scary, I'm scary. So we should be friends, really. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so th that's how we started. And she was my role model. She was a very tough woman. And uh, I remember when I had an interview to take a much better position within Telefonica, she came and she hugged me. And, uh, and I would never expect from such a tough woman, uh, like, uh, you know, um, like that motherly instinct, and this is again where we go wrong, because what we think is not true. What we think is so not true, and uh, we just have to do things. And just to explain, uh, the, the way I want this format to be, I will finish very quickly, because I want you to ask me some questions, uh, because that will be the best way, otherwise I can talk forever. Um, so, uh, um, what did I want to say? Yes, I wanted to tell you something else. So I was living in London, in a really, really beautiful place, uh, in Windsor, actually. It's just, it's really a dream. Two girls, husband, uh, uh, a dog, can you believe it? And uh, uh, there is nothing else to tick the box, really. Uh, and, uh, and so my current boss from Etisalat, he met me. And then uh, uh, I was talking to my husband. I said, you know, it's really raining here every day. We need to go somewhere. We need to go somewhere hot. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and he said, yeah, okay, let's go, let's go. I said, you would leave your job? He said, yeah, of course, I can find a job anywhere. And then literally after one week, I get this uh, uh, invitation to work for Eti Salat, uh, but that will involve changing everything. So two points here. My dream came true in one week, but I had to take the risks because how did I know that I will be going to better? Because my life was already perfect. And, and you would never imagine how it can get any better. And guess what? It got so better. You know, it's, it's just unbelievable. Only because I took risks. And uh, the first couple of months were difficult because it's a weird culture where, uh, you know, I'm in, uh, not even in Dubai, I'm in Abu Dhabi, which is even more conservative. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you need to be who you are. You have to tweak yourself a little bit, eh? but don't change yourself because you need to have a sparkle. If you change yourself, you have no sparkle. And, uh, uh, and basically, uh, the main point is just don't be scared to take risks because you have nothing to lose. Eh? And everybody wants you on top positions. They want you, I know, I speak to men on a daily basis. And they, they, every time they see a woman on a high position, they just love them. And uh, uh, so it's not true when they say, oh, brotherhood or women are nasty. I mean, even today, I had, uh, even me knowing that this is not true, I still had this thinking because I went to Ericsson's stand and my pass uh, didn't work. And, uh, and I was like, uh, let me in. She says, no, you can't get in. And I was like, uh, a woman, if this was a man, this wouldn't have happened, yeah? And then about one hour later, I'm coming and it's a man. And guess what? He didn't get me through either. I had to go to the place and correct my pass. So that means again that what we say is again not true. Uh, nobody's here to get us. Uh, we have to make things happen and uh, we just need to have a go. So we just need to not show off, but show up. And uh, this is my uh, conclusion. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to, uh, we now have, um, please to introduce, we're going to have a case study. Um, so if I can ask Clara Palies, um, Head of Strategy, Marketing and Communications for Europe at Ericsson, and Erica Buenrostro, uh, Market Intelligence Manager at BIX. Okay, so we are together. So uh, it's a great to be here today. This uh, mentorship journey has started in uh, 2012 when GSMA Connected Women was invited us to meet, and many of you were there, 
and they invited us in Brussels, if you remember, it was November 2012. And it was a great meeting, and we were wondering, okay, what about, what this journey will be about? And then I, I had the, the opportunity to be uh, the mentor, to be chosen as a mentor. And uh, Vicky uh, made this very nice, because we were talking to each other for more than one hour with a specific slot, changing what we are, or what we were at that time, what were our experiences, and then, okay, some of exchange between uh, uh, what do we want to do. And then my surprise was that during the break, Erika was the first one approaching me and saying, hey Clara, I really don't know how it's going to work, but why don't we try? And that was the beginning. That was the beginning, and the thing is, um, the mentorship program came in a very uh, critical moment in my life. I just uh, came from a sales uh, career or sales job. Uh, I quit, I went to do an MBA, and I just have moved to Belgium and joined Biggs as product manager. But I had a lot of questions. So I was, I was thinking, is, is this what I want to do? Is this the, the, the better fit for me? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm from Mexico, Clara was born in Colombia. So when I met her and I saw a successful woman making a career in Europe, I said, that's my role model. That's what I want to do. So it's why I went and approached her and I said, would you be my mentor, right? Um, so we started, uh, in terms of the format, we decided, so when, when are we going to do it? How do we do it? So we decided to do it every Monday morning before going to the office. We will spend one hour on the phone. And then um, we started defining what do we want to do. So basically I say, I, I want to decide or define what I want to do with my career ne next. So the, the goal was there. And she was also uh, very clever in uh, offering a format that was very free. So we wouldn't have a rigid schedule on what are we going to talk about or, or so on. She would just um, start questioning me. So Erika, where are you now? What did you like about it? What did you do? Uh, what did you miss about your previous role and your MBA? What did you enjoy the most and so on? So and she started shaping uh, or helping me to, to decide what I wanted to do next. And also looking at my strengths and uh, a lot of weaknesses and see how I could overcome those. So at the end, I can say all in all, it was an injection, um, an injection of confidence to each other. Right? And I must say thank you for the great uh, words. And uh, for me, it was also an injection because in this both way communication, mentor and mentee, you receive as a mentor an enormous uh, really value of that because for us, or for me, it was an injection also of confidence because when you have a career, I was studying, I was studying electronic engineering in Naples then, in Italy, then I was through research and development, to solution and engineering department, then to sales, then strategy, marketing, so the career was there, so, but you never feel that you have arrived somewhere, and like maybe you are scared like, uh, you were saying before, you know, how should I Hey, what should I do? How can I manage everything like this in a big company such as Electron, in a very important company? So for me, it was an injection because while I was uh, listening to her, it comes to my mind, okay, now how can I approach also the next steps? What are really the questions I was putting on Erica was my questions, where are my questions? What I'm looking next? when I'm looking forward. And uh, what it was, uh, if you can move uh, some slides, what I, we uh, get from all of this, uh, one more, because I want to show one more. Uh, it's okay. Yes, okay. So what we uh, really took from this was that, for me, it was a very open dialogue. So you know, we don't have hidden agendas, you are not in the same company, you don't feel you are, you know, judge in some way, you are not scared, so this open, and the fact that we were really questioning ourselves what will be next, how are we doing now, what something, some things are opportunities, others are challenges, how can we move forward, and then I think this was the power, of course, of thinking, 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 and then act. We always feel like in a hurry, we always think that we need to take quick decisions, 
So I think this reflection or this moment of reflecting was very, very good. Yes. So what I can say, I can, uh, what I get out of the mentorship is, uh, first of all, it's, it's really, really, I'm very lucky to have a, a person like Clara looking at me from an external point of view and just looking through the lens of my professional life. And because your, your husband is always your mentor, but he has a hidden agenda, right? So she's, she's an external that can just look at you. It's another woman within the ICT industry, which is, I think, a very valuable thing from a connected woman. And that is somebody that has also relevant experience on what I'm doing now. So whatever I'm passing through, she already passed. So we had a lot of situations being there, done that. So, so she, she, could, she could tell me uh, or teach me through her experience. And it was also, um, it's not only a, a nice to have and a friend to talk and so on, but we, we also got some results. So um, last two months I got, uh, I got promoted to market intelligence manager. So I decided I want to move more into the strategy path. So it's a little step towards my goal. So I think we can also say we have results, uh, positive results out of the mentorship. And then maybe my result was that uh, I was, uh, in, during the days that uh, Erika was having this new position, I was managing strategy and marketing already in the region Mediterranean. And then the company has given to me also the possibility to run the communications part. So in the same days, it was like a kind of coincidence, but I think never happened really by coincidence. So we had obtained this great result and it was really good. So Erika, what can we share with uh, all of uh, our colleagues here about what is the recipe for this? Well, I think that if you are thinking of uh, getting engaged into a mentorship program, I think we discussed in the recipe for a successful mentorship is, first of all, you need to find the right match. You need to find a person that you like to talk to, somebody that you relate, uh, and not only professionally, but also personally. It's somebody that you enjoy talking to, eh? because you're going to spend some time, and then you need to be able to, to enjoy that, that one. And also, you need to know what you want to get out of it, eh? because it's a time that you are going to put there. So what is the result? You need to see progress. You need to be able to evaluate and say, OK, when I'm not in the same spot that I was one year ago. At least I moved forward. So you need to be able to measure results. And also, uh, from the mentor point of view, you need to respect uh, the time and the commitments that, that, you, uh, that you do with your mentor. Because, I mean, I know Clara is really busy and she has a, she made time in her agenda, even when she's traveling and so on, to keep going. So I really feel the commitment to, to do my homework, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm entitled, uh, I feel like I need to keep it interesting for her as well. And, well, at the end of the day, the, the last message I would like to give is this is a learning experience, this is a growing experience. So at the end, it has to be fun as well. So you need to, to have fun. We made it fun because we were taking also holidays together with our families. So at the end, this mentorship was a never-ending story. This morning, instead of preparing whatever we were, okay, what's the next? Uh, what are you preparing this? So we were even during breakfast sharing and making a session of mentoring. So I think you you need to take the most. Uh, Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd now um, like to welcome our final speaker, but by no, no means least, um, Jessica Rosenworcel, um, from the who's the FCC Commissioner. So welcome, Jessica. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, like you just heard, I am Commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission in the United States, where we oversee a lot of things involving communications, including spectrum and mobile. So it's an absolute treat to be here today, see so many women in this setting, not necessarily the whole room and the whole floor, but uh, so many women from all around the world, so many women from the private sector, and so many women from the public sector. Because one thing we all have in common is that we all know there are too few women 
who are operating in mobile and technology, and we need to do something about it. So before I get to that, I, I wanted to tell you a quick story. There haven't been that many female commissioners at the FCC, so I want to tell you about my first day. So my first day, it might be like you would imagine if you're in a presidentially appointed position. You show up, the top brass of the agency gets together, and I have my family there, my husband and my kids. And they put out a Bible, put my hand on it. I raise my right hand, and I swear to uphold the law. And that's that. A lot of pomp and circumstance, but over in about two minutes. So after that occurs, I walk down the hall to my new office suite. And before coming to this job, I had always been proximate to power, but not the principal. I'd always been the one with the small desk, not the large office. So I open up that office suite on the first day, and it's big. Gingerly walk down the hall to my actual office, again, very large. I'm looking around, surveying this new space, just thinking, how am I going to fill it up? And then I notice something very strange. There's a giant table in my office. And it's not a corporate table. I've sat at enough of those. I know what that looks like. This is like a dining room table. It's got seats for 12. And it's not making me think of a competent female professional. It is making me think of my family's holiday table and ham and turkey and whatever it is you eat, you know? So I pause and can't stop staring at this table, wondering why this stray furniture has been there. Then it occurs to me, well, I have some power now. I can make an executive decision. First day, first decision, get rid of this table. So that table's gone, and it's months later. Uh, office has my stuff in it. I think it looks good. The walls are a stately, authoritative blue. And I uh, have a carpet that's sort of cleanish. Pictures up on the walls from accomplishments, and like most people in Washington, yourself with lots of high-profile individuals. And I can't stop thinking about this table that I got rid of. And I finally figured out why. Because if you reach some positions of authority, and I'm sure all of you have, you recognize that the best decisions are made when there are more women at the table. That's true when it comes to legislating, that's true when it comes to regulating, and that's true when it comes to companies. And so I don't have that table in my office anymore, and I didn't like it when I owed us, so that's a good thing. But I like to think that I keep an iconic one in mind, and maybe all of you do too which is thinking about how to bring more women to the table. Because I know in the United States, science, technology, engineering, and math are growing three times faster as occupations than any other fields in our economy. I also know in the United States that women occupy 50% of the jobs in the workforce, but they have only one quarter of jobs in technology fields. Now, I think that's a gap that we need to fix as a matter of equity. But I also think it's an economic imperative because we are leaving so much on the table by not including women in technology in the mobile economy. And there is so much more growth and so much more good that can be contributed. And uh, being here, I imagine that you all understand what I'm talking about and probably feel it forcefully in your own ways. But I thought that I would take the opportunity here to share that story with you and tell you how I think about it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, well, that was the last of our speakers today. So um, we now have some more um, networking. Um, just before we do that, um, this is the latest addition to my team. Uh, she's not mine. <laughs> um, but yeah, we gave her a Connected Women t-shirt, personally, of, um, of Vicky. So I just wanted to introduce baby Gabriella, our newest Connected Woman. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed um, today. I know I certainly have, as always. Um, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you, some of you um, now, um, for those of you that can stay. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.